Acknowledgements and thanks normally come at the end of a series. For this series I need to break with that tradition and thank Mr. Eric Lander from a small village in Wales for all the invaluable information he sent me. Mr. Lander helped me with a great number of pictures of the Fire Queen, as it stands in Penarhin Castle, as well as detailed sketches. He also sent me a detailed write-up of the history of the loco and a few interesting measurements and facts that disprove some of the nonsense that can be found on the internet. Mr. Lander was a volunteer at Penryn Castle and did many hours of work on the current display, as well as extensive research on the Fire Queen, some of which has been paraphrased in the series. I actually stumbled on the Fire Queen by pure chance. I was looking for a Crampton loco to design and build, and this little four-foot gauge quarry tender loco was one of the hits. I only found out afterwards that any credit to Mr. Crampton for the design was most likely false. In truth the beautiful Fire Queen owes its heritage and history to the young bold engineer that designed her, and the persistent young lady, who saved her from the scrap heap by twisting her dad's arm. The Fire Queen, and its sister Loco the Jenny Lind, was supplied in 1848 by Alfred Horlock and Co. of Kent, for use by the Dinorwick Quarry, costing approximately £1,200 each. They hauled slate along the four-foot Padarn Railway. According to the information available the Fire Queen and its sister Loco were the only two Locos made by the firm, which predominantly built marine engines. Alfred Horlock started his company only two years before supplying the Fire Queen, and at that time was only 22 years of age. Supplying two Locos is an incredible feat for an established engineering firm, but even more so for a young engineer with a relatively new company. The design of the loco is generally credited to Mr. Thomas Crampton based on his 1847 patent. I've read through this patent and that claim seems a little far-fetched, I most certainly wouldn't call a slanted cylinder and large wheels behind the firebox novel even in those early days. I'm surprised Stevenson never challenged the patent. I would like to believe that Alfred was a sharp young engineer that walked around with his eyes wide open, incorporating what he saw into his designs and engineering builds. In all likelihood he borrowed some of the ideas circulating at that time and added them to his own unique loco. The Fire Queen design has a number of very progressive features for that era of locomotive. Everything is bolted directly to the boiler with two subframes carrying the wheels and smoke box. The problem with a configuration like this when coupling the wheels is the lack of differential expansion allowance between the coupling rods and boiler, but it did allow for a lightweight composite frame structure that is incredibly rigid and strong, while using the absolute minimum in materials. Simple coil springs are tucked neatly between these subframes, balancing the spring forces centrally on the axle boxes. The cylinder exhaust had a very large cross-sectional area, allowing free flow. This was bolted to the cylinder and the front splashers. All the valve gear and steam lines are easily accessible for repairs and maintenance. The safety valve covers, chimney and dome were all smithied into shape, not a small feat to be sure. Interestingly, there is no evidence of a pressure gauge. It's likely the engine man drove the loco by ear, and the two safety valves. I'm sure those steamers that have spent many an hour behind their locos have found this to be an easier method of driving than trying to peer at a scale model gauge. An interesting mistake that cropped up regularly in my research was the lagged cylindrical box behind the chimney, which was claimed to be a sanding box, with the lever on the right side the shaker. This is in fact the blower valve. The only sanding gear on the loco was on the tender, this was two funnels with pipes to the wheels. The tender was most likely modified from a standard gauge tender for the four-foot gauge. Spacers are still visible between the axle boxes and wheels. The valve gear is essentially a launch-type Stevenson gear, but it is lifted from below by a reversing screw with the handle above the boiler, at the back head. I saw one internet site reference the valve gear as unknown, probably due to the odd orientation of the lifting link. The expansion link is a lovely cast brass link with iron wear pads on the inside. The boilers of these early locos have always piqued my interest. The Fire Queen followed the standard materials and methods of construction typical of those early days. 
The tubes were brass with the firebox copper and the outer shell wrought iron. Some of the cylinder mounting bolts actually go through boiler rivets. Sometimes, I think model engineers are too concerned with zinc leaching, galvanic corrosion, cracking, etc. The Fire Queen ran for over 30 years with only a few tubes blocked, presumably due to tube leaks. Both locos were in service until 1882, with the Jenny Lind being scrapped and the Fire Queen stored in a small engine shed at the bequest of the quarry owner's daughter, who didn't want her queen to be scrapped. One thing that cannot be rivaled is the absolute eccentric beauty of the Fire Queen, and other than the Sterling singles, I can think of no other challengers. In the end the queen came full circle, she was designed and made by a young engineer and saved for future youngsters by a young lady who could twist her father's arm. The model of the Fire Queen is very close to scale without being ridiculous, although in retrospect I think I was a little. It is of course a miniature, working live steam loco. The coupling rods are about 10% bigger than perfect scale, this is because they would have been far too weak for our track. The prototype did actually have issues with the coupling rods according to the records. Some of the valve gear is slightly different, including the lifting link and the pivot points for the expansion links. In those days the builders didn't worry too much about balancing forward and reverse, in the model I decided to bring the linkages up to date. Then on the prototype some of the components were modified to clear moving parts, this was probably only picked up during the first trial assembly. All these clashes were fixed in the model, one notable example was the crosshead pump clack flanges that were filed almost to the bolts to clear the reversing screw rod, and the pump gland to clear the coupling rod. While on the pump, the prototype never had a bypass valve with a return line. I had no interest in spoiling this feature, so a valve system similar to the prototype was designed and used for the model. The prototype had two pumps, one on either side of the boiler. I substituted the left-hand pump with a live steam injector for hold-ups in the station when on steam, but the clack position is identical to the pump side. Then of course, a pressure gauge is fitted to the left-hand side where a period-specific steam valve to the injector is inconspicuously placed. Another notable difference, but hidden from the judging eye, is the steam regulator valve and perforated pickup to the steam dome. The original steam regulator had a two-valve system with a common lever, but this will be difficult to balance properly on scale. The original also had a perforated steam pickup pipe, similar to Sterling's design, that was omitted in the model to improve the live steam volume and water level range. I don't think I've ever used a wider range of manufacturing techniques in any of my builds, everything from fly cutting an inclined profile, to leather work, casting copper and even DIY brass plating was needed to finish my model. A challenge for me personally was the pace of assembly of this build. By the time you've made the assemblies and fixed them to the boiler, to check the valves, you've practically finished the loco. This is very different to other builds where there are definite milestones, for example, the mechanism can be checked on air before the boiler has been started. It takes a little discipline to keep going with no loco taking form on the stand. For my model I ran out of granulated tin, so all my castings were made from a new alumina bronze I developed as a cheaper alternative to my standard bearing bronze. This alloy worked like a charm. Finally, as with all my other builds I used extensive use of laser cut plate and modern manufacturing techniques and materials. Describing this loco is an interesting exercise. Visualizing the assemblies, like the frame construction, using normal orthographic projection is tricky. I'll make use of exploded views and isometric views to help visualize how everything fits together. For the complete drawings you can follow the build in the Model Engineer magazine. Let the series begin.